Welcome to the Meet Mistress podcast. I'm your host, Emma Butler, and this is my audio diary of life on the farm as a full-time farmer, wife, and mother, not always in that order. And oh yeah, I also own and operate a butcher shop. Thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time as I chat all things farming, small business, and more. Okay, friends, um, this one might get a little heated. This is probably one of my top topics of things that grind my gears. Um, this podcast will kind of focus on two different areas. Okay, firstly, I have to rant to you. I have to vent. I just got to complain and let it off my chest for a minute about customers challenging or questioning the price of your product. Okay, that's one part that I got to rant about. But then I'm going to give you a little bit of hot fire tips and solutions, maybe tricks on how to value your product, how to price it. And maybe I'll dive in a little bit too of how to kind of best market it. So let's dive in and see where this conversation goes. Okay, so I do just need to take a second on this subject to sympathize with you if you are a seasoned-ish business owner like myself, or if you're maybe new in business and you're just starting out. Pricing your products is hard. It is probably one of the most challenging things to owning and operating a business is what do I sell things for? What is the value on this product. Some of the things that you really have to keep in mind right off the bat is that you are not selling this product to yourself. I have lots of products in my store, for example, that I as a consumer, I might not buy them. That might not be something I'm looking for. That might not be what I am looking to spend. However, I have customers that fit that profile of this is within their budget, it's unique, It's exactly what they want. They're more than happy to purchase it at whatever price point that might land on. Now, if you're not familiar with my business, I have a farm to table retail store and butcher shop. So we are farmers first. We raise beef, lamb, and chicken on our farm, and then we send it off site to an abattoir to be harvested. The animals then come back to our shop in what's called like bulk. So they're just, they're they're big pieces. And we dry age all of our beef on site, dry age all of our lamb on site. Um, Our chicken obviously doesn't get dry aged, but we chill it all. And then we subsequently retail cut, package, and sell direct to consumer all right on site, right on our farm. So right off the bat, in terms of my products and what I am offering for sale that I produce is a premium product. There's no two ways about it. I knew that we had a premium product when we were selling out of our garage before we had any of this. And I knew that our pricing strategy and the way that we are going to price our products is going to have to match the quality of the products, but also the target demographic. Now, when you are first starting out in your business, you don't know where your target demographic is. Whether you're gonna have a brick and mortar location or whether you're going to retail online, you really don't know your customer until you get selling. So if you're starting out and you don't know who you're selling to yet, just put some things out there and just try it. My pricing strategy is always to price high because you can always drop your price. You can always put something into a bundle or a deal or on sale, but raising your price is very, very difficult. Now in my field, because I am in the meat industry, it's kind of twofold. I have the home field advantage because I own all of the products. I own the animals, everything is mine. So I don't have to follow market value very closely, whereas other butcher shops, meat stores, stuff like that, grocery stores in my field, they have to follow the market value of meat because they just buy and resell it. Whereas what I am doing is very different. I don't buy meat, at least beef, lamb, and chicken and resell it. I do buy pork and resell it, but I also buy that from a producer. 
but in the terms of the products that I have for sale, I own all them. I own them completely start to finish. So for us and our pricing strategy, we have a premium product. We price it accordingly. It is also packaged premium. It's cut by hand. It's dry aged. It's well labeled, well marketed. We have a beautiful facility. We've done all the things. So that does have an associated cost and an associated price point. But when you are just starting out and trying to figure things out, you kind of just have to land on a number and a profit margin that is comfortable for you with that in the back of your mind that you can always go down later. I would always suggest to start higher and come down later because with that strategy, if you're going to put a value to something, you will find your customer. You will find that target market naturally because they're going to gravitate towards you and your business in terms of pricing whether they like it or not, you know, you're not going to please everybody. And my biggest hot tip, I really want you to hear this one out when I say this, my biggest hot tip is that you are not to price your products according to the budget of your customers. You are not to price your products according to the budget of your customers. And what I mean by that is don't be pricing things based on what your customers say. So if your customers come to you and say like, oh, the price of your ground beef is too high, Emma, you should lower the price. To me, I mean, that kind of hurts my feelings because all of the things that I put into getting that ground beef into your hands, but that's just one customer saying that I can't afford your product. I want you to lower the price. But standing in line behind that customer is six or seven people that see the value, that understand the value, that are more than happy to pay the price. And those people standing behind that person might think that my price is a steal of a deal and this is great for them. So you don't want to price your products according to the budget of your customers because they're gonna be all over the map. They are going to be everywhere. I'll put it in the analogy of buying a new car. Say you wanna buy a new car in the worst way and you shop around and you go to a dealership and you really land on a Cadillac and you are like, I love this Cadillac. I want to buy this Cadillac. Sign me up. I'm buying the Cadillac. And you get there and you know, you, you want a Cadillac, but your bank account might not allow you to have the Cadillac if you know what I'm saying. So I might want the Cadillac, but I might have to get a little Nissan instead. So that analogy can go back to whatever plethora of products that you're going to offer, whether you're making bracelets, whether you're offering massage therapy, maybe you're growing and selling flowers, maybe you're doing meat just like meat, whatever it is you're doing, price your product like it's a Cadillac and you will find the Cadillac customers. If you price your product, now I'm not knocking these on, but if you price your product lower, you're going to find a lower customer. And I'm not trying to divide your customers into categories or anything like that, but you really need to find your niche and find your group and find those customers that are going to really understand you, grow with your business and continually support your business. Making one sale one time does not do anything for your business. It doesn't. Making one sale multiple times to returning customers, that is where you make money. That is where your business grows. That's where your flour your business is going to flourish. That is where you want to put your energy. And once you have attracted those customers and you've captured those customers, you want to retain them. Ways that you can retain them in terms of pricing is keeping consistent pricing. So if you're flip-flopping your prices all the time, you're gonna lose people. If you're gonna have a brick and mortar location, you absolutely have got to commit to consistent hours. One of the biggest things that I see, in my opinion, when I see other businesses open, is they'll have really wishy-washy hours. Like, you know, they might be open on a Saturday and then close the next Saturday or open a Tuesday or change the hours. You have got to commit because to some level, you need to train your customers. And what I mean by train them is 
you need to train them to always come and see you. So maybe you have a rural business like I do and customers are coming out to your location to see you. You have to be there and you have to be open because they are going to be disappointed if they make plans and travel and come to your location and you are closed. The other flip side to setting hard and firm solidified hours if you're going to have a brick and mortar operation is boundaries. You have to have boundaries in your business. This is a subject I'll dive into a little bit more later and I have in some previous podcasts. So if you want to jump back and check those out, creating boundaries and sticking to them. So having those solidified hours, notifying your customers that you only operate within those hours that you've designated is going to help you as a business owner. It's going to help your work-life balance and it's going to help your customers prevent disappointment because if they know when you're open and when you're serving and when you're there to operate, they'll come for you and they will come for your premium product and they will be ready and willing to purchase at your price point that you've designated for them. They will be there for you, but they need that consistency and you have to be fair to them. You have to understand that they have lives and supporting a small business is not easy. Supporting small business is definitely a conscious choice by that consumer. So you do have a due diligence to do right by them and really set in stone that solidified pricing structure in terms of, you know, we're not going to go up and down on our pricing all the time. We're not going to put things on sale just because they didn't sell the first week. Like some things you do have to ride out and to really have success with those customers and make sure that they're gonna stay and they're going to continue to support you. If you have a brick and mortar location, having those solidified continuous hours, and even if you don't have a brick and mortar location, even if you are going to go a digital route, same thing, maybe you limit your hours that you're going to answer the phone or respond to emails or DMs or however you're, you're doing communication with your customers. Maybe you just limit those hours to more of an operational hours type of a setting so that your customers can really get to really get to know you and really learn when it is you operate, how you're going to serve them and how you're going to be able to be there for them. Okay, so for this next part, we're gonna dive in just a little bit deeper of physically how to price your products because I don't know about you, but I didn't know how to do this and I'm still figuring it out. To be honest, I'm still figuring it out. So on products that you buy at say wholesale and resell, obviously figuring out pricing is easier. If you bought it for X, then you sell it for X, and the difference between the two is called your profit margin and that's how much money you're gonna make on the sale of that item. Um, in a retail setting, a comfortable profit margin is usually somewhere around 30%. Now, if I just floored you and you're like thinking that's too high or too low, I would love for you to weigh in on this subject. DM me on Instagram if you wanna talk about it a little bit deeper because I would love to know, but 30, 35, 40% profit margin is very typical, which if you didn't know that, which I really didn't, it makes you rethink the entire schematics of shopping in general. Like when I go to a store now, I look at a store like Walmart and I look around and I just think to myself, you know, a store with volumes like that and all the products they're bringing in, like they must be making bank. Like they're making set, they're paying cents for products and turn around and selling them for big dollars. So um, that's not exactly attainable for a, a small business in a lot of ways, but that mindset is something that you have to understand of when you buy products, you have to resell them and you have to make your money back. When you price products that you are reselling, you also want to build in a little bit of margin in case you have to put that item on sale. Now I want to dive into a point I was speaking about earlier of you buy something and it maybe doesn't take off the way that you thought it would. So you panic and put it on sale. Don't do that. I don't wanna tell you what to do, but don't do that. Don't be thinking that just because it doesn't sell in the first net 10 or net 15 days that it's never gonna sell. So 
some products when you buy and resell them, it comes down to marketing. You can't necessarily just buy products, put them on the shelves of your store or drop them in your online store and just hope for them to sell. Some products you really do have to work with and work at to sell them because if they're not moving, but it's right in the wheelhouse of your business and the pricing is right and everything, if they're not selling, you're not doing a good enough job of telling your customers that they want them. Because a big aspect to this whole game is telling people what they want. You sometimes have to tell your customers to buy things. You have to pump them up. You have to do, say like maybe a branding photo shoot or some Instagram posts or an email direct to consumer or talking to your customers in your storefront or whichever way of communication you have with them and telling them to buy it because a lot of the time I'm finding that customers they want to buy from you but sometimes they don't know what to buy or in my case I offer so many options and such an array of products that sometimes my customers are a little lost of you know, they come to my farm store and I have so much, they just don't know where to begin. So that's where we really build on that customer relationship in the farm store of talking to our customers, really getting to know them, understanding what they're there for, and just helping them navigate the store and get what they want. Because I don't want our customers to come and feel obligated, like they have to load up and spend two or $300. But I also don't want them to feel like guilty if they come and just buy one thing or don't buy anything. I never want my customers to have that type of an experience. I want them to come to my store or shop online with us or interact with us in any degree and just have a really great experience because, you know, maybe they buy one small thing the first time, but then they come back the next time and they pick up a couple more things and then the next time they pick up a couple more and then we've built a relationship and we get to know them and get to see them and, it just grows. Now when it comes to pricing, building in that little bit of margin for a sale, especially on the products that you're buying and reselling, is a good idea in case you have to put it on sale. If something lives on your shelves for six to eight weeks and isn't moving, and you've tried all of the things to sell it, then that's a good idea to maybe think about putting it on sale and then maybe you don't bring in that product again or you just kind of see if you can find a comparable product that would work better, maybe at a little bit lower price. You have to factor in all the things. Now pricing a product that you manufacture or you make or pricing your service, now that is hard. I sympathize with you, I know how hard that is. So in my business, there's a multitude of factors. So. I'll talk to you in terms of a ribeye steak. So a ribeye steak is a premium, premium cut of steak. It is one of our highest price point items in terms of meat cuts because it deserves it. It's a very luxurious cut, I want to call it. It's very succulent, well marbled, very beefy. It is a boneless cut. Now the ribeye, when I go to price something like that, the factors that I have to take into account are the actual quality of the cut, so what it is, where it comes from in the animal, the quantity that comes from the animal, because an entire cow is not made up of ribeye steaks, so the fewer amount of something in an animal, the more dollar value it is. So for example, a tenderloin, there's only two tenderloins in an animal, so a tenderloin is going to be a higher cut as well because there's so few of them in an animal. Same with ribeyes. There's 12 to 13 ribeyes on each half of an animal. So 20 to 25 steaks, we'll call it for easy math, depending on the thickness is what I can get out of them. So the quantity, the quality of the cut, also the manpower and the time it takes to craft that cut is an absolute play into price point. So a boneless cut takes more finessing, it's more breaking from the carcass, it's more work on our butcher block to get it to the packaging, to get it to the retail counter. So all of that is a factor. So when I price my cuts, I make sure that I take all those into consideration. Now on a little more economical cut, so we went from the ribeye, we talked about the tenderloin, on a more economical cut, say like, 
a sirloin. There are quite a few sirloins in an animal. They're fairly easy for the butchers to break out and break down. That is an economical cut. It is still very high quality. It is still dry aged. It still has our premium packaging, but economy cuts sort of fall under that reign of there's quite a few of them in the animal. They're easier to get out. All of those are a factor. The other aspect when pricing a product that you produce or a service that you are providing is you have to really do need to bear your soul in the sense of this is your baby. This is your thing and your time and your value. So you have to look at you and your business and put a dollar value on yourself, which is, it's, it's hard to do. Most people are humble like me and it's hard to put a price on yourself when you're out in the workforce, you know, it's easy to apply for a job and get told you're going to make $21 an hour and you know that you're valued at $21 an hour, which is, I'm not knocking that. That's a great, that's a great value, but you have an employer or a business telling you what your value is. When you work for yourself, you don't have that. Am I going to go out there and say that I'm a hundred dollar an hour value employee? Well, I mean, me to my business, I kind of am, but no, realistically I'm not. So when you're trying to price it, you have to make sure that you are putting a high enough dollar value towards your product or your service that is going to justify all that you put into it and all aspects of the business without reaching too far. So without saying I'm going to do it at a thousand dollars an hour to come clean your house for my housekeeping service. Like that doesn't make sense. Right. But you put maybe a $30 an hour to come clean your house on it. That makes more sense. And that aligns with a lot more people and aligns better with budget and everything else. Same with your products. So maybe you're growing flowers. Maybe you have a flower farm and you're selling bouquets. I, I praise the flower farmers. I have lots of friends that are flower farmers and they are the real deal because growing flowers is not easy. You will not catch me doing that ever. But if they want to sell their bouquets of flowers for 25 or $30 per bouquet, there has to be associated costs and overhead and value that attributes to that 25 or $30 or 25 or $30 bouquet. So if you're going to do a 25 or $30 bouquet, you know, it should have lots of blooms in it. Maybe not a lot of greenery. It should be wrapped really pretty. Maybe you add your business card or your logo or a piece of ribbon, something extra to really dive home to the consumer that this is worth 25 or $30. If you just have a tiny little bouquet with maybe two or three flowers in it and the rest all shoved full of greenery and you don't have any other fancy stuff to dress it up, you'll be hard pressed to get customers to spend that dollar value. So Although pricing products is the hardest thing to do, I know that you can do it and I know that you can put some thought and time and energy into it to make it successful. And I would just really want to keep it in the back of your mind that you are valuable, your business is valuable, your product is valuable, and wherever you land is what that product is worth. You cannot let your customers dictate what your product is worth because they don't necessarily know or understand all that goes into it to make that product happen. Okay, so I know this is a longer podcast. I promise you I am wrapping it up, but you're really getting a lot of mean potatoes in this one. I really hope that I'm doing you a service for the time that you're giving me to listen to this episode all about pricing. I hope that you're able to take something or some little things away from it and you can turn around and apply that to your business or maybe you hear this and maybe you don't have a business yet or you know or aren't there yet but maybe you know somebody and maybe you learn something and you pass it on to them or you direct them to this podcast or my instagram i'm at jne meets on instagram if you want to check that out um i really do appreciate your time so i just wanted to say that 
The third part of this pricing focused podcast that I really wanted to to talk about um, to wrap up my thoughts here is marketing. So I will say that one of the keys to my success in my business has been marketing. Now, mind you, I'm a marketing bit of a guru. I love it. Marketing, advertising, sales, that kind of stuff is definitely my wheelhouse. It's where I have a lot of strengths. It's where I have a lot of interests. So naturally, my marketing game is going to be strong because that's what I'm really good at. I know lots of other business owners that have a really strong, you know, accounting and numbers brain. So their books are straight and awesome and maybe their marketing's not great. I don't have good accounting, but my marketing's great. So we're just going to keep rolling with that uh, that train. And the part about marketing that I wanted to talk to you about and how marketing relates to pricing is for my pricing strategy and for my marketing strategy I do not lead with pricing first. I actually rarely mention pricing anywhere, to be honest. So I do not lead with pricing first. Now a pricing first strategy is something like an XYZ retail meat store grocer. Now you know the ones I'm talking about, the ones that sell chicken wings for like 99 cents a pound. Those type of places, those type of grocery places are not comparable to me and my business on any any form. Um, and I'm not in competition with them whatsoever. I'm only ever in competition with myself. So my pricing strategy and my marketing strategy are two different things. My pricing strategy, my products are priced aggressively. We have talked about this this entire podcast that, you know, I put the prices on my products that I know that they are valued at and that's what they are and they're non-negotiable. Do I have customers that say, hey Emma, your pricing's too high on this? Yeah, sure. But I know that I can't please everyone and I know that not everyone is my target market and I'm not trying to sell to everyone. I am trying to sell to a very specific, very niche customer and that is a demographic that I am going after. If there are other customers that, you know, look look at me or look at my stuff, or if there are other businesses out there that are looking at my stuff and saying I'm priced too high, that's okay too because I'm not trying to sell to another business. I'm trying to sell to my customers and my consumers and my community that I've created and that I have cultured. So my pricing strategy, my, my products are priced aggressively. That is, that is how it is. They are priced at their value. And my marketing strategy, I don't advertise price forward. You you don't really see me a lot saying, I have chickens for only this price per pound. You're not gonna see me doing that kind of stuff. When I talk about a sale, you don't really see me flashing, you know, sales advertising all over the place because it's not really something A, that I do a lot, um, and B, that's not my marketing strategy. My marketing strategy is I always want to advertise myself as the producer first, our farm, our family, our farm to table story, everything about us, all these really good bits about our business that make our business, that build our brand, that contribute to our customers and that really feed into what the core values of our business are. Those are the things that I advertise. I advertise the high quality of our products, the premium packaging, the dry aging of the beef, the obviously hormone and antibiotic free meat, just like all meat in Canada that we serve in our farm store. Um, Our farm to table difference because we raise beef, lamb and chicken on our farm, all that kind of stuff. Those are advertising points that I market first. I rarely ever market price or even mention price when I am talking in terms of advertising. My pricing in terms of if customers are looking to see like what my things cost, they can always go on my website. They can contact our farm store directly. They can always reach out and ask if they're looking for pricing on specific cuts. But it's not something I lead with. A price forward strategy for the type of business that I have, for the type of consumer that I sell to for my target demographic, to be honest, pricing means nothing. I'm not selling to those customers that are always looking for a deal. You know what I mean? I'm not selling to those type of customers. 
if they come and buy from me, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm so grateful to have them. That's wonderful. But those are not the people that I am going after. I'm not looking to, to attack that market of price first. I like to attack the market of value first. And this is what you're getting. And this is where it comes from and all that kind of stuff. So if that is a pricing strategy that would fit you in terms of you price your products aggressively to their value and then you market and sell those products through all of your channels that don't include price, I feel as though with the success that I've had in my business and my knowledge of sales and marketing to begin with, that that is a better set way to advertise. It's a better set incentive for the customers that you want to build and the brand that you want to build. Now that does also come back, of course, to the type of product that you are selling, the type of service that you have. Maybe if you're doing like couples massages for X amount of flat rate, okay, maybe then you advertise your customer mas or your, your couples massage massages with that sale price of X dollar value. But maybe you're selling hand squeeze lemonade and your hand squeeze lemonade is, you know, in this really big container, it's hand squeeze, it's fresh, it's, you know, all these things, you know, maybe you keep that pricing element out of it and then you advertise it more on the value that the customer is going to be getting from purchasing this fresh squeezed lemonade or say you're making bracelets like really anything any product or service that that you have that you're going to be trying to sell to this marketing story first I guess theory is it a theory I feel as though like that you will do better with that than you will advertising price first. Because I feel like what happens when you advertise price first is you immediately, immediately it's like politics, right? It splits the room. Pricing instantly divides people. You will have some people that think you're too expensive. You'll have some people that think you're too cheap. You will have a lot of tire kickers. If you've never heard of a tire kicker, that's somebody that like always asks you, for pricing or inquires on your stuff or whatever and then never commits to buying from you ever. You don't want those type of people either. I feel like I've been a little bit ruthless in my business weeding out those tire kickers because I don't even entertain them. If you've messaged me on Instagram 15 times asking me the price of brisket, at some point in time, I'm not going to respond any longer or I'll say, please see our previous 15 conversations that we've had on this subject because <laughs> I just can't with the tire kickers. They rarely commit or they'll commit to you one time and then that's it. So I'm not really looking for that. So in terms of having that kind of price forward strategy, when you do that, when you advertise this sale price or price first or price, 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 that really I feel doesn't do you justice for your business or your product because you're going to split the room. You're going to all of a sudden figure out, you know, who's interested and who's not, which maybe that's what you want. That's not what I want because I feel as though I can sell my customers on lots of different things. I have lots of different things available for sale and different things to offer them. So if I was offering a price forward strategy of, you know, say I had ribeyes on sale for $19.99 a pound, which I would never, by the way, I'm just attributing that to that. If that's what I was doing, all I would sell is ribeye steaks because I've put it in the customer's heads that I have ribeyes for this price. Whereas I would rather say, hey, I have dry aged ribeye steaks, I have dry aged T-bones, I have quarter houses, I have this, I have that, it's all farm to table, it's all hand cut, premium packaging, all those kind of factors I would rather advertise because maybe that customer was going to come in for ribeye steaks because they heard them advertised at X price, but maybe once they hear all of the other things that they could get instead, they will change their mind or change their plans or spend more or, you know, whatever it may be, it's in the customer's hands at that point. So the point of this final thought in terms of pricing strategy is really think about the way that you want to advertise your products and the way that you want to market them because that also attributes to a price point as well. So when you are pricing your products, how you are going to advertise them is also a very big key element in your pricing. I always kind of factor a couple cents on the dollar 
for advertising, if I make a new product, say I make a brand new sausage variety in our farm store, say we make can make this never before seen variety of sausage, I know that I'm gonna have to sell this thing. I know that I'm going to have to label it. I'm gonna have to photograph it. I'm gonna have to maybe make a couple posts on Instagram about it. Maybe I have to boost it on social media. Maybe I have to talk about it a little bit more in our email list. Maybe I have to create an infographic. Like there is a lot of work attributed to selling that one product to make sure that it is successful. So that also has to add to your pricing, like the amount of marketing that you put into something has to, to add to your price. Just like when realtors, for example, are selling a house, they factor in a couple bucks for marketing to be able to offer that house for sale. It is just sort of a cost of doing business, but it is something that you should be considering when you are pricing your product. I hope that this long winded, rancy, little bit off the rails podcast did something for you. I hope that you learned something from this. I feel like the pricing is a topic that is, it's a revolving door. I mean, it's always changing. If you have any questions or anything, I would love to hear from you. You can um, head over to our Instagram page at Janie Meets, leave a comment, send me a DM. I'd love to chat with you more about this if you have any questions. Um, I will always offer you my unsolicited advice, um, but if you are looking for any sort of you know business type courses to help you kind of elevate that, they are available out there and I would be more than happy to direct you to those resources. Sources. But again, thank you so much for listening to the Meet Mistress podcast. It really means so much to me that you are here and you're listening. And I know you had to give a little bit more time to me for this one. So thank you so much for sticking it out. Again, I can't wait to hear from you. If you get a second and you would like to, if you would leave me a review, it would really, really help. Or if you would share this in your social media that you listened to this podcast, it would be awesome. Again, you can tag me currently at Janie Meets on Instagram and Facebook. I would really appreciate it. I will talk to you on the next one. Good luck on your pricing journey. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Meet Mistress podcast. I'm your host, Emma Butler. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. Thanks for listening. I can't wait to see you back here again. If you'd like to keep up with all things happening, J&E Meets, which is our farm store and butcher shop, you can find us over on Instagram at J&E Meats and on Facebook as well too. I will talk to you again very soon.